Following on, it's, it's interesting. I don't plan series of messages, but they sort of plan themselves. And uh, this is one of those times where we've had a series on presence and a series on different things. And so this is kind of becoming another series just on the, the how-to. How do we develop those Peshitta eyes that we were talking about, those simple, clear, straight, and true eyes that allow us to see things? And uh, so I was thinking about... What we've talked about the last few weeks, and I want to try to get a little more practical this morning about how we actually can do this, how, how it works. And I was thinking about a movie that I'd seen years ago, and I remember this one scene where a woman is talking about having stayed in this great five-star hotel, and she said, you should have seen their rooms. You know, they're all satin and velvet, and the bed, royal blue, trimmed in lace as clean as snow. And then she says, it's hard to imagine that a room like that don't change your life. But it don't. <laughs> Why don't it? If you think about that. You know, we so focus on our peak experiences, don't we? We focus on the life-changing nature as we see it of one of those peak experiences. We talk about, this will change your life, that will change your life. And the things that we experience that are so intense, you know, so, so just, you know, revelatory. And yet, do they really change our lives? We think if we could have this or we could have that experience, that would change our lives. People have talked about having healing experiences, especially over behavioral things, healed from addiction, healed from this, healed from that, about conversion experiences. Some of you have had really intense conversion experiences where, where you, you just really felt God's presence in a supernatural way. I, we probably, most of us who have gone to reti retreats have had epiphanies on retreat up in the mountains over the weekend, and we think, that's got to change my life, right? And then we get back down the hill, and by midweek, we're back in old patterns again. What happened to that life-changing experience? And those who were healed from certain things, and those who had these great conversion experience, and you check back in a few years later, they're back into old patterns again. So what is really life-changing? We've talked about this in here before. You know, we are not defined by what we do once. Our character is not defined by what we do once, what happens once to us. We are defined by what we do every single day, what we get up intentionally and purposefully to do day in and day out, every single day. And the healings and the conversions and the epiphanies that we've had, if they really turn out to be life-changing, if they turn out to be that moment, that hinge moment where our life went in a completely different direction, it's because we showed up the next day and the day after that and put into action, put into practice those things that we believe have changed in us. The behavior that was the result of the life-changing experience. Those life-changing experiences as we see them, they're catalysts, actually, for change. But the change is actually a decision that we make, that we have to keep making day in and day out. I know I've used this analogy before, but you get married on your wedding day and you say, I do. And you think, that's the only time I have to say I do for the next 40 years? If you don't get up every morning and say, I do, again and again and again, then you're saying, I don't. That's the way this works. That life-changing event is only life-changing if we follow through with everything that it represents in us. Everything that should change in us has to be a decision that we make. Now, the last few weeks we've been talking about Jesus telling us that we need to see with clear eyes. We need to see with new eyes. He's always talking about, he who has eyes, let him see. He who has ears, let him hear. He's always talking about having that new vision, that new way of seeing that's going to make a difference. We talked about how this eye, this seeing, is really a mindset that has to go against the programming of our past. We talked about how this last year, 2020, has created a programming in us. We are programmed to fear now. We are programmed to see things in a certain way. Those are our old eyes. 
But if we're going to make a change, if there's going to be a transformation in us, then we need to see reality as reality actually is. And ultimate reality is what we call God. Are we going to be able to see God as God is? Are we going to have that apocalypse that we talked about last week, the unveiling, the reveal of God's presence in this moment right here and right now? Not looking anywhere else, but looking within, looking starting here in the details that are right in front of us. Because if we can't see God now, we're not going to see God later. This is it. This is the moment. And so the question becomes, how do we do that? How do we make this change? How do we find the transformative properties of these events in our lives? Well, typically what we want to do as Westerners especially is to gather information, don't we? I need to know more. I need to know more theology then. I need to gather all of this and understand all of these concepts. You know, people going after podcasts. Come on, we all go after podcasts, don't we? Podcasts, reading books, going to see speakers, going to see therapists, talk therapy, counselors, mentors. We're trying to find something that we can put into our heads that's going to make a difference, that's going to change things. But if you think about it, how many good students that you know of actually change, really change. In any group, there's always going to be a small percentage that actually change. When I started on this path, I was just like what I'm talking about. You know, my, my head is so spun all the time. I was looking for that thing. I was looking for that information. I was looking for that piece, that missing piece out there someplace. And after years of study, I was still just as neurotic as when I started. Nothing had really changed. But when I started doing something, then things started to change. It was a breakthrough that I had, that all the knowledge that you can gain, anything that can be talked about, all it can do is show us the doorway. It can show us where the door is. A lot of times I tell people, you know, when we're talking here in counseling or in, in spiritual direction or even here in, in a setting like this, if the one thing that I can do for you is put a red X over the treasure on your treasure map so that you're actually digging for the treasure and not just digging holes, that's a good thing. But that's all that can happen from information is to get an X in the right spot on your treasure map. But you're still going to have to dig to find out if the X is over the right spot because you don't know before. How could you possibly? Here's a door. You're going to have to walk through the door, the door to find out if it's the right door. And this is the, the problem that we have when we think, especially with Western minds, is that we are so intellectually based. We are so looking for information and data. We are so looking for accuracy as opposed to truth that we get on the wrong track. But there is always a percentage who put new knowledge actually into action. They risk something real to find out. We talked about last week that no theology is effective until it's personal, until it's put into action in your life, until you've risked something real, until you become vulnerable to the connection that's available. Then things start to change. This is so important to understand, so important. Jesus' first followers, you know what they called themselves? They call themselves followers of the way. Not followers of Jesus. Not Christians. That term came centuries later from the outside to describe this new sect that was up and coming. They understood that they were not just following Jesus, but they were actually doing what Jesus did themselves. And in that doing of what Jesus did, that's what made them followers. Not just saying that they were followers, not just agreeing with Jesus. But when they started doing what Jesus did, then they became followers. Then they'll be, they became talmidim, the word that is used for follower or disciple. This is a critical distinction that we have to make. If we're following a way of living life, then we're following Jesus. Jesus is telling us that it is in this action, in this way of living, that takes us to the Father, that takes us to be able to see reality as reality actually is. 
Now, we want truth, but we want truth without having to take the journey, don't we? Because the journey involves risk. The journey involves uncertainty. The journey involves being disoriented and getting lost. The journey involves taking a descent before we can take the ascent on the other side, and none of us want to do that. We want to imagine that we can just keep ascending, that we can find this truth that will take us exactly where we want to go, risk-free. we got to understand this. It's different. Truth actually materializes under our feet with each step we take. There was this car commercial that I remember. The car is zooming across, and the road is actually materializing under the front tires. You ever see that one? That's really what it's like. We don't see the road before us until we put our foot down, or Indiana Jones taking the leap of faith. Remember that's that famous scene? We don't see it, and it feels risky, but every time we put our foot down, there's something underneath. The truth materializes as we go in motion. We can't do it from just safely sitting on our couch and trying to figure it out, or listening to a podcast and get that vital piece that makes it all clear. It doesn't work that way. Look at what Jesus says at John 8, starting at verse 31. Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. How many times have we heard that one? But it's the first part that I think we miss. If you will continue in my word. In Greek, the word there that is translated word is logos. And we know that from John 1 that it means more than just a word, just a spoken word or a printed word. Logos means the underlying reasoning, the underlying reality of everything. In Greek philosophy, that was, that was the idea there. It, it has to do with reasoning and a way of reasoning. It has to do with the motives behind something. It's much larger than just the word itself. Milta in Aramaic also means word, but it means something larger. It can mean the word, it can mean the sentence, it can mean the whole story, it can mean anything that's fully formed from beginning to end. These words together, the understanding behind this word is the underlying reason, the underlying expression, the underlying worldview, if you will. I don't think it's too far a stretch to say that if you continue in my worldview, if you continue in my way of seeing, if you continue in the motives that I have for everything that I do, then you will know, and the word there is yada. And yada doesn't mean to know with your head. Yada, originally, the root is, is word for hand. When you are able to handle something, like a journeyman carpenter knows his or her tools, and they can feel the weight of them and the shape of them in their hands, even when they're not there. That's knowing from this point of view. It's intimate experience with. You will know the truth, and the truth there, serara in Aramaic, doesn't just mean accuracy as we think of truth, but it means a harmonious, harmonious or right direction. It means that which actually liberates or opens possibilities. So if we're going to translate the first part of that is Jesus is saying, if you continue living as I live with the way that I see things and see life and see reality, then you will intimately experience right direction. You will intimately experience freedom, the freedom of new possibilities that will open to you. And the obvious implication here is this only happens in motion. It can't happen from a standstill. It doesn't happen to static objects. In motion, doing that which Jesus does is what puts all of this into play. Last week we read Matthew 6, starting at 22, and this is what we just alluded to. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, then your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness... Okay, now what are we talking about? How can the light be darkness? Then how great is the darkness? And so we realize that Jesus is speaking metaphorically here, but the words actually come to our aid if we put them back into Aramaic. Ay, ayina, means an opinion. Again, it can mean a worldview. It's a way of seeing. Is the lamp of the body. And if your eye is clear, peshita, clear, straight, true, sincere, 
if it is fully transmitting everything that is there, not creating a filter, not clouding anything, then your whole body will be full of light. Nura, that doesn't just mean physical light. It means order. It means straight and true. Again, same idea. But if your eye is bad, if it's bisha, not evil as we think of it, but immature, unripe, not ready for prime time, if it's just not ready yet, then you're going to be full of darkness, hoshech, which means the opposite of nura. It means chaotic, disordered. Where nura is order, hoshech is disorder. So if the order in you is disordered, how great is that disorder? Is what Jesus is saying. If we don't have the eye to be able to see, you don't have the, the mindset, the worldview to be able to see what's really there clearly. Now, following right on that, Jesus starts to get practical here. How do we put all this together? The next verse, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Okay, this is where it gets very limited for us in English. First part is pretty clear. We can understand that. You can't serve God and wealth. God, Allah in Aramaic, means unity. It means oneness. It means multiple things functioning as one. The Jews were militantly monotheistic, understood God as one, this unity of all things. You can't serve that unity. You can't be one with, and at the same time be serving, the word here is mamonas, which comes from the Canaanite deity of greed and avarice. But it's, it's avarice personified, but it's even more than that. The idea here is anything that you pile up in your life that comes to define you, anything that is so important to you that it reorders all of your choices, all of your decisions, it affects all of your relationships because that drive is so important, that's mamonas. And when we are focused that way on something that is so important in our lives, whatever it happens to be, then the unity that we could see if our eye was clear is gone. Everything is fractured. Everything is now divided into haves and have-nots and, and comparisons and all the things that we find ourselves staying awake and staring at the ceiling at 2 o'clock in the morning that destroys the sense of unity and oneness, the sense of okayness. This is what Jesus is talking about here. That which we obsessively pursue, that which we obsessively covet, becomes the idol in our lives. Now, these drives in us are so basic. They are so built into our survival mechanism that they're not even conscious most of the time. Most of us may not even be aware of the real drives that are motivating us and motivating us in life. Have you ever just surprised yourself by doing something that you didn't even think about doing? It was just kind of done? Have you ever driven a car and then found out that you are eight exits past your exit and don't even know how you got there? It happens to me all the time. <laughs> Have you experienced something like, what's, what's driving the car when you're not there driving the car? I mean, how does that work exactly? Have you ever thought about that? And what is it that motivates us to do things before we even think about it? All of a sudden, we're walking away from something. What did I just do? How did that happen? I mean, am I just... Am I the only one? I don't think so. I know I'm not because Paul says exactly the same thing. You remember Romans 7, starting at verse 15? Paul says, for what am I doing? I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing that I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Now, this is a very strange saying when we just listen to it, but it actually perfectly describes what's going on inside our heads, in our makeup, what's actually going on inside our brains. If you start to understand what the, the latest kind of neuroscience is talking about, in the past 30 years or so, neuroscientists have started to break the brain down into three parts. I don't know if you've heard this before, but it's really kind of interesting. And these three parts, I mean, this is going to be a vast oversimplification of it, and then there's, you know, there's always different ideas and theories as we go, but basically we've got three parts to our brain. 
The lowest part, the most primitive part, is called the reptilian brain. Sometimes we call it the lizard brain. Why? Because the the various structures that compose, it's, it's a complex, it's not just one thing. It's, it's the uh, brain stem and it's the ganglia something or other. And it's these structures in the brain are also what are present and dominant in a reptile's brain, in a lizard's brain. And that's basically all they got, right? And so that lowest form of the brain, that primitive form of the brain is still incredibly important because it... I want to read this so I don't mess it up. This um, is involved with reflexive behaviors such as muscle control and balance. It controls breathing and heartbeat, feeding and digestion, all those involuntary things that are just motoring along that you never even think about, right? Gosh, you had to think about beating your heart. How distracting would that be, right? No, your lizard brain is doing that for you. It's monitoring all that and taking care of it. It's subconscious, this brain is subconscious. Two of the three brains are subconscious. There's only one that's conscious. The lizard brain also controls fight or flight and reproduction drives as well. So all of those things are subconscious. They're really not under our control. I mean, do you have control over when that adrenaline shoots through your body? You know, when, when the car comes to the side and, and all of a sudden you feel that spike of adrenaline? You don't have to think about that. That's being done for you. So it's controlling fight and flight and reproductive drives as well as habits and procedural memory. This is really important to distinguish between procedural memory and memory as the way we think of it. Procedural memory is something that you do all the time over and over again until you don't have to think about it anymore. The examples they have here is putting your car keys in the same place every day without thinking about it. Riding a bike. You know, it's just like riding a bike. Why? Because it's stuck there down there in your subconscious. You don't have to remember it. It's already there. If you've done it enough times, it's coded in there. Around this reptilian brain that sits right down at the brain stem is what also is called the paleomammalian. Mammalian. Yeah, I think that's right. In other words, old mammal brain. It's also called the limbic system, and that's a lot easier to say. This includes the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the cingulate cortex, some of those you've probably heard of. This is the center of our motivation, our emotions, memory is here, and including such behavior, learned behavior as parenting and the drive for parenting. This is why you don't have any control over your emotions. The emotions come and the emotions go. You can't control that. Now you can control what you do about the emotions, but that's a different part of the brain. That's a third part of the brain. So even the limbic system gets coded in with things that it needs to know in order to survive that become instinct for us. They become pre-programmed. When we talk about 2020 being pre-programmed in this, this is the part of our brain that we have programmed with a 2020 mindset. And that's why it's not going to automatically change in 2021 until we do something about it. Until we intentionally and with conscious awareness start to change behavior then this limbic system will continue to motor on. And then the third part of the brain is the neocortex. That's the part of the brain that we are familiar with, with all the folds, and that's the biggest part of our brain. And it's huge in humans as compared to primates and, and other animals. This part enables language, abstraction of thought, reasoning, planning. This is the conscious part of our brain. This is what we're thinking with. That voice that is inside your head right now, that's part of your neocortex. This is the conscious part. The other two are subconscious, but they work together to keep us alive. In an article I found, automatic routines, which over time we have learned to do without thinking about them, such as playing tennis and even driving, are largely performed by our reptilian brain. So when we are driving and at the same time engrossed in a conversation with a friend, we may find that we have driven somewhere with no memory of how we did it. That's because the reptilian brain was doing most of the driving. Sometimes, something that we are not conscious of, such as a particular smell, can trigger a complex emotion for reasons that our conscious mind cannot understand. That can occur because the paleomammalian brain has processed the smell, retrieved a memory related to the smell, and triggered the emotion relevant to that experience. Even though it's not the experience you're having, it's doing all this on its own. It is only once our neo-mammalian brain, that's the neocortex, cortex, becomes conscious of the smell and the memory that we understand our emotion. It could be the way someone looks at you 
other people's reactions around you or something someone says. We may fly off the handle at someone, avoid a situation, freeze up, feel nervous or scared. Our brain just wants to keep us alive, but it does make us react in an over-the-top way sometimes, especially when we haven't dealt with all our stuff. A lot of humans go through life with their lizard brain in the driver's seat. <laughs> That's a great image, isn't it? Controlling responses to situations and people. It can be difficult to see that these reactions are based off old experiences. These threats are no longer real, but to our minds, they're very real. And they trick us into thinking that they are. Notice our emotional triggers. Noticing our emotional triggers is a huge step. Self-awareness is power. When we understand ourselves, we can shift the way we think. If we keep waking up every day and doing the same thing in the old way, our brains won't change, and we will keep reacting from the same place. Sometimes you have to shake things up a bit and try a different routine in order to create new neural pathways in the brain. Now, you can see how this perfectly describes Paul's dilemma. You see that? See what's going on? It also perfectly describes the way Jesus teaches, why he doesn't answer a question directly, because it's the question itself. It is the mindset. It is the eye of the questioner that is the problem. Not getting some sort of information, that's not going to fix anything, because they're still working within the same old neural pathways. When Jesus answers a question with another question, when he answers a question with a story or a parable or a complete non sequitur, what he's trying to do is break that neural pathway, just spinning around and around in the questioner's mind, and get them to take a quantum leap over into a new place, experience something different that they realize is different, so that everything is changes. See, we can see what Paul is up against because this is what we're up against, too. I think we can all say with Paul, what the heck? You know, I thought I put a stake in the heart of that thing 20 years ago, and here it is again. You know, here's that feeling again. Here's that urge to do X again instead of Y that I've been doing for so long. He had his conversion experience on the road to Damascus. He was seeing life from a spiritual place. The scales literally fell off his eyes, if you remember the story so that he could see clearly. But he was still living through his lizard brain. He was still working against that programming, and the programming was working against him. Now, later on, in one of his latest epistles, he writes that he has learned to be content in all his circumstances. He had to learn to do that. It didn't happen right away. The story of Jesus in the wilderness is another perfect example. Jesus faces three Symbolic temptations. They are representative of every obsessive compulsive drive that we have to face as human beings. And here is Jesus working them, working them with scripture, working them with action, working through them so that he can get to the other side of them, working past the obsessive compulsive drives and the programming of his past so that he can walk out of that wilderness and come back home and say, I and the Father are one. You don't need to see the Father. If you just see me, there's no daylight between us. We are one and the same. This is what it takes. How did they do it, though? How does it actually happen? Well, Jesus puts it this way at Matthew 6, and this is just following on for where we were, starting at verse 25. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, not for your body, as to what you will put on. Is not life worth more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at these birds in the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life or a single inch to his stature in another gospel. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, they do not spin, and yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not 
much more clothe you, O you of little faith. What is he doing here? He's listing all of those primitive drives of the lizard brain, all those needs that we have. We're like, we worried about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, your body, the clothing that you will put on. Worried about the longevity of life. Can you, by worrying, add an hour to your life? Clothing again. He's coming back to all the primary needs, the things that will take the unity out of our sight as we focus on each one of these things and see ourselves in competition with everyone else as we try to get these things, as they become the primary force and drive in our lives. He's talking about how we must transcend these drives, these needs. And he's talking about worrying in a sense of allowing these drives to be the primary drives in our lives, the drives that can take us against love and choices for love and choices for relationship. And there's two steps that is implied here, and he shows us in different areas of the scriptures. And the first step is awareness. Without awareness, we can't do anything. If we are not aware that these drives are in place and are, and are moving us in directions that we're not even conscious of, in real time, when it's actually happening, then no other choice can be made. We have to bring ourselves into consciousness. This is what prayer is all about. Real prayer, as Jesus practices it, is a prayer of awareness. When Paul talks about constant, constant and continuous prayer, he's talking about constant and continuous awareness of God's presence in the moment, to be aware of us in the moment and all the relationships that connect and how our choices affect those relationships. When we have that kind of awareness, then the second step can kick in. It is the action that we take. And this is faith. Biblical faith is action. It's not thought. We equate faith with belief. Uh -uh. Faith is the action that we take because of the belief that we have. Without action, there is no faith. We think the opposite of faith is doubt because it's an intellectual property. No. Faith is the ability to act in the presence of doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. That's the opposite of faith. If you think you're certain, you're not operating in faith anymore. You're also operating in illusion because there is no certainty in human life, but that's another story. But here's the thing. It's the choice that we take, awareness and action. And the action will probably be 180 degrees opposite of what the trigger of the lizard brain is trying to get us to do. He says, oh, you have little faith. Faith, haimanuta in Aramaic, means confidence. It means firmness. It means trust, just as the, the Greek equivalent does. It means trust, ultimately, trust in action. You of little faith, meaning you who are unwilling or unable to act against your programming to act in concert with what you have come to be convinced of. That's little faith. To act as if the lizard brain is not actually running your life. And to act constantly as if the lizard brain is not running your life until it actually isn't anymore. You have literally reprogrammed it. You have created new neural pathways and reinforced them to the point that that now is the programming of your lizard brain. And you don't have to fight it anymore. That's what happened when Paul finally learned to be content in all circumstances. It took him years to do it, but he did it. He was now able to have that as his default position, to learn to be content If you think about the way Jesus teaches, you realize that Jesus gives us very little theology. He's not trying to get us to think. He's trying to get us to act. This action word that he gives us, this motivation, this, this new way of seeing is all of action. It's a way of living life in love. When Jesus is asked what the greatest commandment is, you notice how he pairs it down? You know, love God with your whole heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. He pairs it just down to that. Everything else supports that. Everything else is commentary, according to Jesus. Do that, and you've got all of the law and the prophets, which means all the other written material that Jews had in their book. 
That's it. Action. Love God by loving each other. Do that. You've got it. When he gives the greatest commandment at the Last Supper, just love each other as I have loved you. Everybody's going to know you're my followers by your love, not by your faith statement, not by your doctrine, not by what you say you believe, but by the love. That's it. Following Jesus is not an event. It's not a conversion. It's an ongoing action, building awareness of this connection that we have in love. It's about creating daily rituals that bring us into that awareness. Action that deprograms the lizard brain and reprograms it in concert with everything that Jesus is teaching. Something that we do every single day, every single week. Now, some of these actions, some of these rituals are going to be based in real life, and in community. It's the things that we do with each other, but others are going to be symbolic. They're going to be ceremonial. And here's the beauty of that. Our subconscious mind, those other two brains or parts of the brain, do not know the difference between a real act and a ceremonial or symbolic act. It's just neurochemicals in the brain. The consciousness isn't there. It can't make that distinction. And so the things that we do ceremonially, the things that we do ritually are just as important as the things that we do in real life between each other in terms of reprogramming, in terms of being able to bring awareness and light to our whole system, that light that Jesus talks about. If your eye is clear, the light will flood your whole body. This is literally what's happening here. Religion used to provide us with symbolic ritual. It used to provide us with ceremony. It used to provide us with liturgy. And not so much anymore. I mean, there are still liturgical churches, the Catholic Church and High Lutherans and, and Episcopalians and so on and so forth. And so you have the Mass, if you're in a liturgical church. You have Stations of the Cross. How many of you remember Stations of the Cross? That is an action that we take. We move. We walk. We experience something. It's ritual. It's ceremonial. It's symbolic but it's doing something at a deeper level that we don't even realize. The rosary, liturgical cycles throughout the year, fasting and praying attached to those liturgical cycles. Those are all ceremonial acts that do something real within our system. But even these have lost much of their power because they're not connected to the, sim the meaning behind the symbols anymore as much, and they're not connected to the larger culture anymore. They're more isolated, and so they don't have the same power. So most of us, whether we're in a liturgical church or not, and especially if we're not, we're going to need more to help us become more aware, more that we're doing on a daily basis, more that we're doing both corporately, but really importantly, just for ourselves when nobody else is watching. How are we going to practice opening our eyes to God's presence in every moment? And we don't realize how simple things, simple things, everyday tasks can be very significant if we repurpose them, if we see them in a different way, if we just institute very simple things to make a difference. In our uh, midweek uh, mid Zoom calls and uh, discussion groups, we had one woman who said, and she's a clinician, so she said every time someone walked into her office to either talk or to have a session, she would light a candle in the room. And that candle would burn for as long as they were together and talking. And then both of them would get up together and blow out the candle together. She said, of course, this is before COVID when you could do such a thing. <laughs> but think about it. She lights a candle to symbolize that connection, that awareness of each other, that this time is dedicated for this. And that candle burns, and they blow it out together as they symbolically move into the rest of their lives. How would that deepen the conversation? How would that deepen your sense of active listening and presence? I do something similar without the candle when I'm going into a, a session, counseling session. When I shut the door, you know, I'm aware as I shut the door that everything that is my life is on the other side of that door. And the only thing that is on this side of the door within these four walls is this other person and me and what goes on between us. Symbolically creating that space, it makes a difference. We've talked about our communion tables. I've gotten a few pictures from people that are still 
dressing their communion tables at home on the other side of that camera. And it's such a beautiful thing to see for me. And the care that they put into it, how beautiful they make it, the, the important things that they choose to place on that table with the bread and the juice. It can be pictures of loved ones. It can be little um, wooden signs with, with sayings on them or scriptures on them. What they choose is so interesting because it's all about them and all about what they're using to create this ritual, this symbolic gesture that brings them into presence. You know, some people are taking prayer walks. There's meditation and centering prayer. These are all ways and things that we can establish as a structure, as a regular practice in our lives that is going to help us to connect. I was having lunch with, uh, actually with, with Jerry, and we were picked a restaurant right across from the Basilica here in San Juan, and we met at noon, and right as I got into the parking lot, the bells went off, the Angelus at noon, and I, you know, it, everything about my childhood came back. I, you know, how many times was I standing in the playground at recess when those bells went off? And it was a regular thing. These were calls to prayer. Sometimes they were calls actually to church, but they were times that brought us back. Is there something that we can do along those lines? Can we set a special ringtone on our phones to ring three times a day as a call to prayer? That would be a simple ritual. And it's not that you break your stride in anything that you're doing. It's just internally. You hear the sound and it's remembering, oh, yeah. God, you're here. You're with me. You're part of my day, part of what's going on. Someone who was grieving the loss of someone went back to her Hispanic roots, and she created luminarias, which are these paper lanterns, paper bags with sand in the bottom, and you put a candle into the sand, and it lights up the bag. And she had them all around the front of her house and even some up on the roof. And she sent a picture to me to show me. This was her way of being able to honor, and you write the name of the person that you're honoring on the bag. Beautiful ritual. Roadside shrines, when someone has died at a certain point that we see cropping up, these are ways for people to be able to place their grief, to connect, to honor, and to help them through the process of mourning. Frank and Jerry have, have lost their moms both in the last month, or last two months or so. Jerry went back to Maryland. Frank is still in Texas. And both of them have told me that their primary job was to pack up um, their mom's home to go through all the things, all the clothes, put them in categories, pick the things that needed to stay, things that went to goodwill. And both of them told me that it was very, very important to them. The, the, the process of doing that, the ritual of doing that was healing, it was therapeutic. Um, it's interesting that some of their siblings didn't feel that way and didn't want to have anything to do with it, but they were able to immerse in that and find a way through in that. We hear at the effect, we have our Good Friday ritual where we write the things that, are, that we're dealing with on the papers and nail them to the cross. And then on Easter Sunday, we put flowers on the cross and, and decorate it as new life. On Christmas, we write on our ornaments. We just did that last month. And we put those on the tree. This is the way that we can create rituals Sharon was telling me about the ritual that she did at her mom. She just lost her mom as well um, two months ago. And at her memorial service, she borrowed our sandboxes here, and she had two of them set up, and everyone could get a candle, a little taper, and they could light it, and they could come up. Again, something that you do, getting up out of your seat, walking up, putting the candle in, writing on a note, and that was so significant to her father. He loves those notes. They're going to bind them into a book so he can have them. Rituals, things that we can do. It is amazing how these things have an effect that you're not aware of. When I was little, Sunday mornings in the Catholic Church with my parents was a set thing. Every day there wasn't even a thought about it. We got up, we got dressed, we went to church, we sat through Mass, and afterwards we got to go to Paris Restaurant. And I always remember Paris Restaurant where we got, we got pancakes. But I also remember that they had a rotisserie in the front window. It, it occupied the whole window. It was one of these big things with multiple, you know, what do you call those, skewers, you know? And all the chickens were on there, and they were slowly turning against the fire in the back. And I could stand there, you know, I'm basically this high looking over the, the lip of the, of the window and watching these chickens all root. I can still remember that. And, and the pancake, it was just like clockwork. It was something that was so secure for me. 
as a child, something that I could count on. Later in, in my childhood, getting into adolescence, for some reason, I don't know what happened in my parents' life, but we stopped going to church on a regular basis. When I got into my 20s and I was living my own life and kind of left the Catholic Church, I'd always get depressed on Sunday afternoons. And it was a while going into this that I started to realize it's always Sunday afternoons, and I would start to wait for it. And just like clockwork, Sunday afternoons, I would get so debilitatingly depressed. When I got into my 30s and I started going to church again in the evangelical church, suddenly I wasn't depressed on Sundays anymore. And it took me a while to figure it out. I had lost that routine that was so secure, so comforting, and I was feeling the effects of that. And when I had replaced that ritual with one that was very different, but another ritual on Sunday mornings, suddenly it filled that space. And I wasn't depressed anymore. This is the way that these rituals can work in our lives. 2,000 years before there was any hint of neuroscience, <laughs> Jesus knew that spiritual awareness can transform us from the inside out. It can reprogram us for kingdom. And he teaches based on that belief, based on that knowing, that the only way to transformation is ongoing action, and ongoing action always in the direction of connection. It's the only way that this works. One last scripture to close it. At John 14, Starting at verse 5, Thomas says to Jesus, and just to put this in context, this is at the Last Supper. Jesus has told everyone that he's going away, and they're freaking out. And John, Thomas says to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? And Jesus says back to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip jumps in and says, Lord, just show us the Father, and it's enough for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? This is classic. This is classic that Thomas and Philip and the rest of the band right? Following Jesus. We're still looking for knowledge. They're still looking for information. They were still looking for certainty. They were scared. Of course they were scared. Everything that they have followed, everything that they have pinned their hopes on, is saying he's leaving them? That's worth a pout, right? What do you do? You're looking for that certainty, looking for that knowledge. And yet Jesus still only points them to this way of living, that produces a result. And that result is himself. You see that? I am the way. I am the result of living this way. We misinterpret that line. We want to think intellectually again that it's some kind of intellectual litmus test for understanding Jesus in a certain theological way. Jesus is saying, no, I am the result of, I am the product of living this way. He himself is the conviction. He himself is the mirror of his Father's love. He is the way itself. Not certainty, but the way to conviction. What you have experienced and know to be true from the bottom of your socks and the bottom of your lizard brain. It's still faith in action in the midst of uncertainty of life that takes us where Jesus is trying to get us to go. So the question is, are you ready to make the transition from thinking into action, into the action of faith, to build a structure of daily ritual and awareness in your life in some way, the way some of these people have done, to make it fun, to make it personal, to make it colorful, to make it feel alive, to put energy into it and not even be aware of how it's changing you, but just showing up day by day and engaging and enjoying the moments. This is what makes 
all the difference. This is what Jesus is trying to show us. Let's pray. Father, we probably are very frustrating, I would think, at times. But maybe not. You know what we need before we ask. You know what we're going to do before we do it. But it is frustrating for us to feel that we're somehow always starting at square one. Help us to see that it is the way that we're going about things that needs the scrutiny, needs the awareness, that there is another way for us to live our lives in you, in connection with you, in concert with your love, that will take us where we really want to go. Help us to continue to put Jesus right in front of us so that we can do what he did, not just say we're following, but actually do the things that he said that we could do also. That's what we want in our lives. Help us to find creative new things that we can do and to really enjoy the doing of them so that we will get up and do them the next day as well and find that we are moving closer and closer to you. Again, Lord, thank you for your constant presence, always here, always drawing us, never letting us go. Never let us forget we can only love because you loved us first. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen? All right, let's stand.